closing prayer by the speaker. And so right now, let me give to you without further ado to Pastor Edson to give us the opening prayer. We don't hear, Pastor Edson, we don't hear you. Hello. Gracious Father in heaven, Lord, we are praising your name at this moment, despite, O oh Lord, of the challenge that we are having right now. One of the elders of our church here in Sintasunto Churches, Elder BJ, he is now in the hospital, O oh Lord. We don't know what is the problem about him. But Lord, we do believe that you are the great healer. Please be with him, O oh Lord. Comfort his uh, family members who are now also in uh, hospital. Lord, we also thank you so much for the promises you have made. Your privilege, privileges you have bestowed. And we are grateful for this opportunity tonight that you have given to us to listen again the topic about the Lunar Sabbath to be presented to us by Dr. Ibanez. Lord, we are asking your blessing, your wisdom to be imparted to our speaker that he would have full authority from you as he speaks to us. Thank you, Lord, for you have been calling us in different capacities. We thank you for the gift of your word. As we think of these things, open our hearts and our minds to hear you through our presenter. We ask these things. In the loving name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Pastor Edson. Now we give time to Dr. Merdolf to give us the introduction. Uh, good evening, everyone. Good evening. I would like to welcome our resource person this evening on behalf of uh, Southern Asia Pacific Division and also uh, Island Adventist Mission. Our resource person this evening is Dr. Ronilo, Ronili Chato Salvador. Dr. Ronili is a professor of aquatic sciences and presently the OIC Dean of the College of Agriculture, Fisheries and Natural Resources at the University of Eastern Philippines, Katarman, Northern Sama. She is also one of the officers of the Philippine Association of Adventist Scientists for PAAS, an organization recently established under the ACSD GRI office. She obtained her PhD in fisheries degree from the University of the Philippines in the Visayas, Iloilo, and had postdoctoral training in fisheries governance at Wageningen University, the Netherlands. She is passionately involved in aquatic research, particularly on seaweed biotechnology, indigenous species biodiversity conservation, and aquatic resources inventory because the beauty beneath the surface of the waters impressively amazes her and strengthens her faith in a creator God. She had the privilege of serving as visiting researcher on seaweed biotechnology at the Southeast Asia Asian Fisheries Development Center for SIPDIC and at the molecular, molecular biology and Biotechnology Laboratory of the Marine Science Institute, University of the Philippines, Diliman, Quezon City. Presently, Dr. Salvador is the president of the Federation of Institutions for Marine uh, and Freshwater Science, Sciences, a national organization of academic institutions involved in aquatic, aquatic research. She is a recipient of various awards, most notable of which are the 2017 Dangal Nangbayan Award 
from the Civil Service Commission and the Chad Republica Award. Her life's aphorism is, no destination is beyond reach, the one who walks with God. So we welcome Dr. Ronely Chato Salvador now. Microphone, please. Ma'am, uh, microphone, sir. Mic, mic test, mic test. Uh, Dr. Salvador, you may have a mic test. Uh, we don't hear you. Hello. Oh, okay, now. Okay, now. Okay. All right. Good evening, everyone. Thank you, Pastor Merigal, for the generous introduction and for inviting me to this virtual Bible and Science Forum to share scientific insights on dietary loss, which is one of the controversial issues confronting us. And I'm very pleased that I've been involved and I've been given this rare opportunity to, to be involved in God's way. Um, allow me to share my screen for my presentation. For many people, the question or the decision to eat or not to eat something is a baffling one. But for us who adhere to the admonition of God in the Bible, this is not a problem at all. Because God had long time outlined in Leviticus 11 what can and what cannot be eaten. But humans as we are, we try to question, what is the purpose of God for this dietary loss? In 1974, he and Allen published in the Journal of, the, of American Scientific Affiliation a scientific manuscript of the results of a study they conducted to ascertain from various denominations what do they think is the reason of the dietary loss in Leviticus 11 with the aim of determining whether this law still can be applied in the modern time. They found out that there was no consensus among the various religious denominations, even among rabbis or among Jewish Orthodox. They grouped the responses and they outlined the responses into nine theories. And these are the ones that are listed on the screen. The theory of obedience testing, the theory of arbitrary command, assertion of divine authority, moral discipline, hygiene, spiritual symbolism, pagan worship, and religious badge. And there were theories also, the three combinations of the different theories that I've mentioned, and they grouped this as eclectic theories. And so they concluded that the evidences that we have gathered were not enough that more evidence is needed, especially in archaeology. And I would suppose we would need more um, evidences from science as well. If the purpose of this dietary laws can be determined according to them, then perhaps we can make modern applications of lessons from them. And so tonight, I would, I'll be sharing some scientific insights from the perspective of science, hopefully to shed light on why these laws were given. And I would like to confirm that the benefit of mankind was foremost of the mind of God when he laid out this dietary laws. 
I will be very specific and I will be talking only of the aquatic animals that are referred to in Leviticus 11. And thus my title will be from Fins and Scale Scientific Appreciation of Leviticus 11 verse 10. In Genesis 1, 20 and 21, we were um, informed that the aquatic animals were created in the fifth day. God said, let the water swarm with swarms of living creatures. And God created the great sea creatures in the water. I could not see my screen, excuse me. And every living creature that moves which we reached the water swam according to their kinds. And God saw that it was good. Yes, they were good and dead and did. That is why even the psalmist exclaimed in praise, O Lord, how manifold are your works. In wisdom have you made them all. The earth is full of your creatures. Here is the sea, great and wide, which teems with creatures innumerable, living things both great and small. And so the world, after the fifth day, teemed with the world beneath the surface of the deep, teemed with diverse and complex living organisms. And God said in Genesis 1, 22, be fruitful and multiply and fill the waters in the seas. God created all of these aquatic animals for a purpose. Some of them, the purpose of the ecological, some of them as food. In Leviticus 11.10, when eating of animals became a practice, the dietary laws were laid out. It was specified that anything living in the water that does not have fins and scale must not be eaten. And it is repeated in Leviticus 11.12, which states that you must not eat anything that lives in the water and does not have fins and scales. And further, this is repeated in Deuteronomy 14. Yes, ye shall eat of all that are in the waters, all that have fins and scales shall you eat. And we take note that in all the verses that they have read, it always is an and, fins and scales. And whatsoever hath not fins and scales, ye may not eat. It is unclean to you. Uh, we notice that uh, these repetitions, with these repetitions, we can assume that God must be very serious and that he would always wanted us to follow these laws for our benefit. In the listings in Leviticus 11, animals were grouped as unclean and detestable. Uh, in the first few verses of uh, Leviticus 11, the land animals were considered unclean. And there are examples of land animals that were unclean that we should not eat. Three for those that chew the cud but not part the hoof. And one for those that part the hoof, living footed but do not chew the cud. But in other animals like fishes, the fowls or the birds, the wee insects, and those animals that creep on the ground, they were called detestable or abomination. So there were examples given for birds, for reed insects, and there are those that creep on the ground, but none, if you take no, no mention of an example of a typical fish that can be eaten or cannot be eaten. And according to the Ellicott's commentary for English River, he says, not a single typical fish is given by name in Leviticus 11. And the law itself is expressed in the briefest and most generic manner possible. And it was evidently left to those upon whom the administration of the Lord involved to define it more minutely in order that it may be observed in practical life. And this uh, gives us uh, a more valid justification why there is a need for in-depth scientific studies or in-depth uh, looking for support for the uh, obedience or the implementation of Leviticus 11. Now why would God prohibit 
prohibit the eating of finless and scaleless aquatic animals. And why are finless and scaleless aquatic animals unclean? Sure, there are scientific explanations for this command, and I will be dealing with those in the later slides. Just for the basics, there are 10 phyla belonging to the kingdom of the animals or kingdom animalia. And nine among these 10 phyla are called invertebrates. These are animals without backbones, but they have hydroskeleton for protection and support. And all of them do not have fins and scales. Again, according to Leviticus 11 verse 9, only those with fins and scales can be eaten. So we do not have problems anymore with this group. The, the last group is the phylum predator or those group with uh, notochord, which, which is the precursor of our backbone. And the subphylum vertebrata or the vertebrates, which consists of five classes, the mammalia or the mammals to which group we belong, then the birds, the reptiles, the amphibians, only the class Pisces or the fishes group possess fins and scales. And so we will not worry anymore about the other species. We focus our discussion on class Pisces or animals with fins and scales. Technically, a fish is aquatic. They live in water. They have gills for as a direct respiratory organ for breathing. They have a backbone and they are equipped with fins. So any aquatic animal without a fin is not a fish. Even if they are called a fish, like jellyfish, it's not a fish. Like starfish, it's not a fish for the main reason that they do not have fins. They do not have backbones and they do not have gills for breathing. Now, there are different kinds of Fins. The first type are the median fins. These are what you're going to see when we determine whether a particular fish can be eaten or not, a particular aquatic animal can be eaten. So the median fins are found in along the mid sagittal region, which is the middle midline region of the fish the dorsal fin and the caudal fin. The caudal fin is actually the tail. Now the dorsal fin is the one that is found at the back of the dors dorsal region of the fish. Another type of fins are the paired fins. They're called paired because there is one at the right part of the fish and the other part of the fish is another one. They are, they are in pairs. So the paired fins are pectoral fins, pelvic fins, and the anal fins. So most fishes, the clean fishes, have complete set of fins. They have paired fins and the median fins. Although in some fishes, these are fused. So all throughout, the dorsal is fused with the caudal, the caudal is fused with the anal, so all throughout the body, they have uh, fused uh, fins. Now, these fins function for balance, particularly the dorsal fin and the, uh, the anal fins. They keep uh, the fish upright in a proper position in the water. And you can, but just by looking at the shape of the fins, you can tell whether the fish is a bottom dweller or it is in the living in the open ocean, and if they swim fast, they're just like the tuna, they have uh, two dorsal fins, not just one. And they also have finlets behind the dorsal and anal fin, which are the distinguishing features of the tuna. Uh, pectoral fins and pelvic fins are for steering, if they would, where they would like to go, and the caudal fin uh, serve as the structure for moving forward. These are the different types of caudal fins. And you have, you can see there the different shapes and different positions or locations of the dorsal fins of fishes. Now, uh, as you can see, these are beautiful um, fishes. 
the seahorse is a fish. It has, uh, you can see the dorsal fin and uh, another one is the sargassum fin. It's a beautiful full one. The dorsal fin is in the form of a very long spiny uh, spines, long spines, they have long spines. Now let's talk about the scales. There are different types of scales among fishes. But the most common are these four, the placoid scales, which are the scales found among sharks and the rays. We have the ganoid scales in the sturgeon and the paddlefish. fish. The, for most bony fishes, the ones that we uh, commonly see in the market have uh, cycloid or thinoid scales. The functions of these scales are for protection from pathogens and predators, or from disease-causing organisms, and reduction of friction in water. As they swim in the water, the fins provide them um, uh, additional support in uh, moving forward because of the reduction of friction in water. Fishes have different scalation characteristics. There are scales that are very tiny, that you need to use a microscope to see them, to large. Then there are also scales that are very thin and they're very thick. There are also simple to complex. And in terms of extent of body coverage in the fish, there are fishes which are partially scaled, whereas there are fishes that are completely scaled. As to fastness, this is very critical because we might see say that uh, this fish do not have uh, scales, but actually there are species of fish that have deciduous scales. When we say deciduous, they are easily shed off once they are taken out of the water. And you can know that if you look at your basin where you, fast, where you wash the fish, and you can see some very shiny things in the water. That means the scales have been removed once uh, they were taken or they were washed in water. The, in terms of scalation pattern also, there are those that are overlapping like uh, roof shingles or some scales in the fish are just mosaic. They're very minute and they are uh, laid out separately. Now, these are examples of fishes without scales. The catfish do not have scales at all. Now, the cream dory, the ones that they sell in Chow King, and their fish fillet, those, those uh, fillets came from Pangasia species, the cream dory. These are catfish, we are not supposed to eat them. Uh, we should not eat uh, fish fillet or sweet and sour fish from fast uh, food restaurants because they usually use catfish, uh, the cream dory in the fish fillet. There are also fishes with deeply embedded scales, like for example, the eels, we call that here in the Philippines, the casili. Their scales are very deeply embedded. And these are examples of fishes with deciduous scales. When we say deciduous, they, they fall off easily, this is not persistent. And these are easily shed or rubbed off. So we have the hearings, the anchovies, or the, we call that bolly now here in the Philippines, the slip mouth or the sap sap, and then the half beaks. They, they have uh, deciduous scales. Now, sharks, rays, and skates have black white scales. Their scales are also called dermal denticles because they look like armors. Uh, they look like uh, this uh, objects here that you see on screen. This is taken using an uh, electron micrograph. They look like spines of the ninja. Now, fins and scales are mentioned in the Bible. For fins, it's mentioned five times. And it, the, the Hebrew word for fins is sinapur, which means flipper or stabilizer. In the case of scales, it has been uh, reported that it's mentioned 33 or 39 times in the Bible, depending on the translations used. And there are four Hebrew words for scales. The Kaskiseth, 
which means imbricated or overlapping scales of flesh. And this is the Hebrew word for the word scale in Leviticus 11, 9, and 10 and Deuteronomy 49. Regina is the word for scale used in Job to refer to the Leviathan. And Lepis is the Hebrew word used by in the Bible in Acts 9 verse 18 when uh, Paul recovered from blindness and straightway there fell from his eyes as it were scales. And the word according to the writers is the Hebrew word for that is Lepis. So it's very clear that the meaning of the scales in Leviticus 9 is imbricated or overlapping scales of fish. Now, the first evidence, scientific investigation conducted to provide scientific evidence on the dietary laws in Leviticus 11 was conducted by a Jewish scientist named Mark. In 1953, this is, I was not born yet during this period, but they was able to take hold of this manuscript. And this is so far the only pharmacological or scientific evidence that we can hold up at these present times. Now, uh, there was no molecular biochemical techniques yet during that time. So uh, they use the commonly accepted technique during that time, which is called phytopharmacology, which is studying the action of drugs, poisons, toxins, and various chemicals using plants as the physiological test objects. So the response of the plant to the test chemical or drug would determine whether that, that substance is poisonous or toxic to humans or not. This is uh, used to detect toxic constituents that are detected in the blood and various fluids of humans. But when they use experiments using animals, they could not be detected. And so they resort to phytopharmacology. Now the data that they are looking into, they looked into the pharma, using phytopharmacology as a technique is the phytotoxic index, which is the ratio of root growth of a seedlings of a plant in this particular case. Uh, Mr. Mack used Lupinus albo siblings. He treated with muscle juices from various extracts. And he compared the growth of the seedlings, the, the roots, the growth of the roots of the seedlings to the control, which is a plant or Lupinus albos grown only in plant physiological saline. The, the indicator there is that the lower the index, the more poisonous the effect. And so they found out, Mr. Mack found out a very interesting result. Using fresh muscle juice from some quadrupeds, including those that were mentioned as unclean in Leviticus 11, and those that were clean, we found out that really those animals or quadrupeds those uh, animals with four uh, limbs really had very low phytotoxic indices. For example, look at the swine, 54. Only half of the roots grow. Whereas if you look at the sheep and the goat and the deer and the calf, they have 90% above growth of siblings. And the highest, of course, in the experiment, we found that the sheep, the highest uh, root growth among the fresh muscle juice tested. From the birds, they also, Mr. Map also extracted 2% fresh muscle juice. And he found out that really those that are not uh, allowed to be eaten, according to Leviticus 11, really had very low phytotoxic indices. So the example is the hawk and the owl that they mentioned. But uh, in the case of uh, turkey and pigeon, they have higher uh, phytotoxic indices. In fishes, again, those with 
teens and males have higher phytotoxic indices, whereas those who do not have teens, I mean, we do not have scales, have lower. Look at catfish and eels, they have very low uh, phytotoxic indices. And here is the additional um, data on toxicity of fish muscle extracts. Look at the porcupine fish and the puffer fish, the skates and the sharks, they have low uh, phytotoxic indices. And here are some more data. Uh, this is one is, is coming from the blood of the fish. So uh, Mr. Mack also extracted the blood and uh, used that to observe its, phytotox uh, its toxicity based on the phytotoxic, uh, phytotoxic index uh, obtained from Lupinus albus. And again, he noticed that for the unclean fishes with do not, we do not have fins and scales, we do not have uh, scales, I should say, a very low look at the sharks, which are not supposed to be eaten. They are very low phytotoxic in the sense. But the conclusions of the MAC studies that was that muscle extracts from animals allowed as food in Leviticus 11 and Deuteronomy 14 are practically non-toxic. Muscle extracts from animals prohibited as food, they are highly toxic. Muscle extracts from fishes with fins and scales, practically non-toxic. Blood from fishes with fins and scales, slightly inhibitory. And muscle extracts and blood from fishes without fins and scales, highly toxic. So we can see that uh, indeed there is scientific reasons for the dietary law in Leviticus 11. Now let us take a look at the physiology and life habits of the fishes, which are called unclean and clean in Leviticus 11. Now, fishes or aquatic animals for that matter have specific niches and it's according to their life habits. So, planktons or the planktonic organisms, which are the primary producers in the aquatic environment, they live in the photic zone or in the lighted zone of the aquatic environment. They are called planktons. And those that swim around are called nectons. Those that live in the bottom are called the benthos. And these have uh, the, their specific niche or their locations or their life habits has some, have some bearing on their feeding habits and also on how they, um, they function and how they function and what their purposes are in the aquatic environment. So, uh, let's take a look at the structure. The fins, as I have said earlier, is for maneuvering and balance, and the scales is uh, for the protection of the organism from predators and prey. Animals with fins, both fins and scales, are usually planktonic. So, they live in the upper layer, the lighted portion of the aquatic environment. They are either planktonic, nectonic, or fast swimmers. Whereas those with uh, only fins, they are benthic or bottom dwellers. And if you're going to relate, relate this to their feeding habits, the bottom, benthic dwellers are carrion eaters, meaning they feed on decaying matter or uh, matters that are already decaying and became uh, very with a very bad odor, they like to eat those. And some of them are suspension or filter feeders and even predators. Whereas the planktonic, and the nectonic, and the fast swimmers, they're usually planktivores. They eat plants, uh, phytoplanktons. They are herbivores, although some of them are also predators. Now, aquatic animals with fins and scales uh, their sources of food are planktons, the phytoplanktons and zooplanktons, and algae also. And there are those that are predators, they feed on their prey. 
Whereas the benthic dwellers, those without fins or without scales, they are carrion eaters or scavengers and they are suspension or filter feeders. They uh, filter uh, anything that is found in the water and uh, the bottom of the aquatic environment is also called the cemetery of the uh, bottom because all that died up in the upper layer goes down into the bottom and this will be eaten by those that are dwelling in, at the bottom. So we all uh, remember that food are sources of nutrients and toxins. And so uh, the toxins together with the nutrients are absorbed in the food. But uh, uh, in some organisms, in some animals, uh, we have a defined digestive system where the toxins and the food are, and the nutrients are separated in the blood and then the waste are excreted through the excretory system. Now, um, in terms of circulatory system, animals with aquatic animals with fins and scales have closed circulatory system just like us humans. We have veins and arteries. So our blood goes through, their blood also goes through these blood vessels. We have a heart that pumps blood to different blood vessels to the different parts of the body. Whereas the invertebrates or aquatic animals without fins and scales, they have an open or lacunar type of circulatory system. They do not have blood vessels. So anything that they ingest will just be dispersed immediately after digestion. It would be just dispersed immediately to the muscles and to wherever um, these nutrients or as well as toxins go. Their digestive system is also developed, but their blood is not uh, the, the same blood as we have. We have red blood because we have red blood cells, but we call their blood as hemocytes. You will notice if you cut the uh, shrimps, live shrimps, they are not red. You see the fluid, the whitest fluid that you see in the crabs, that, that's your blood, but it's not red because they do not have red blood cells. You call their blood hemocytes. So anything that they take in, nutrients or their toxins goes to their, uh, after digestion, they, it goes to their hemocytes or to the blood and then it will be dispersed to the muscles directly. Now remember that the muscles of like a shellfishes, these are the edible portion. This is the portion that is eaten by people. Now, how do they eliminate the waste? Aquatic animals with fins and scales, they eliminated the, the wastes that, that separate the nutrients and eliminate the toxins to their kidney and anus. Uh, those we do not have fins and scale also through the kidney and anus, but they sort of diffuse the waste to surrounding water to their cell membrane. And sometimes in the case of sharks, they just accumulate their body waste in their muscles. They will just um, store the body waste in their muscles. That is why sharks smells very bad. They have different distinct smell. Uh, they look like they've been urinated on because of high accumulation of urea in their body. And that makes them very, very unclean. So sharks and rays retain 2 to 2.5% chloride and urea, which are waste products of protein metabolism in the blood because they use this for balancing in the water so that they become uh, hypertonic to seawater. Whereas in other species, it's less than 0.1% that are retained in the body. Now, fish, finless and scaleless aquatic animals are unclean because the master, which is the edible portion, the masses are toxic and it is very much contaminated by waste and bacteria. And these toxic poisons are not destroyed by heat. No matter how you cook them, they remain there. So according to a report, what the Bible says about healthy living, a sovereign report from Scotland revealed that food poisoning by toxins, virus, or bacteria 
occurred in spite of thorough inspection at every stage of food preparation, including handling and cooking. So why did God create in less and scale this water for creatures? So their purpose is to clip up after others. They are considered as trash collectors. So they are also called sanitation workers of ecology. The, the purpose really is to clean up the environment. They're like janitors of the aquatic environment. So this one is a very interesting a picture that I took from the internet. That we said that streams are actually the cousins of cockroaches, the aquatic cousins of the uh, cockroaches. They would, we will not eat cockroaches. We do not even want to eat the food that we already have touched because they're dirty, but the people are eating their cousins, the shrimps, and also lobsters are also called cockroaches of the sea. Mussels or the bivalves, they are also uh, utilized now as biofilters because they are, they are capable of filtering all the toxins in the water, they can filter, filter up to 25 liters of water in a day. They take out the water and they take in all, they accumulate all the, the pollutants in your body, including the microplastics, pesticides, and other pollutants. And that is why the mussel, uh, the redes, uh, they can cause, this is the, the cause of red tide poisoning, they call that paralytic shellfish poisoning, which do not have an antidote even after this time. So it can cause death, especially among children, but and the, the only reason for this is eating, eating the shellfishes. At a certain time of the year, they are not really they, they take in a lot or accumulate in the body a lot of toxins. And there are other uh, poisonings also associated with ingestion of shellfishes. Diuretic shellfish poisoning, you just have diarrhea. Then amnesic shellfish poisoning, you seem to be forgetful. On, this is, although this is fortunate because the forgetfulness or loss of memory is short-lived. Then we have neurotoxic shellfish poisoning and subatera shellfish uh, poisoning caused by ingestion or eating those. Now, the, the toxins that can be obtained or that we can get from shellfish very high. You can see here, uh, these are the dominant toxins isolated from the shellfishes, the mussels, very high levels of toxicity, which is beyond the tolerance limit of humans. And uh, it is not um, denatured by acid. Even if you add vinegar or you cook them, they are not denatured. And the very uh, unfortunate is that there is no antidote of the toxins. So they will really be uh, the only thing is that you, you let the patient vomit so that the toxin will be eliminated from the body. Now, this one is a parasite also, the, the animals without fins and scales or the invertebrates they also are populated with um, parasites. This one, the uh, crab is the host of the parasite Paragonimus, which is causing uh, lung bleeding, bleeding, bleeding of the, the lungs, and bronchitis, and also meningitis. They also, the shellfishes and some finfishes, those that do not have fins and scales, do not have scales, they are also um, sources of high alle of allergens, and they belong to the top eight food high in allergens. And this data actually is from United States, and this is the only data that you can take hold uh, pertaining to allergens. We really can see that these animals are not supposed to be eaten. And so, again, to eat or not to eat, this food should not be baffling to us because we have 
a, a guideline that has been laid out for us in Leviticus 11. Now, let me show you some of the cases that are a sort of, uh, there are a lot, I receive a lot of questions whether to eat these cases or not. And one particular uh, commonly asked question is that whether it is okay for us to eat tuna and whether tuna have scales. So I, I research on whether the tuna, because they look like uh, smokes. So uh, tunas have complete set, they have beautiful teams. So the problem now would be on whether they have, do they have scales. So according to this base, which is the database the, of the, the largest and the most reputable and the most respected database on fishes, this base said that tuna have coarse leg. Uh, if, you, if you buy tuna, you look at the this portion here, and there is a layer of smooth, hard shell, slip layer of elongate and closely overlapping scales, which cover the forward portion of the body, and we call it the coarse leg. It's one of their distinguishing features. Uh, tuna, uh, this is a, the, one of the fastest swimmers in the sea. They have elongated physical body, they live in the opposite ocean, and their body is covered with very small cycloid scales. So uh, what you can see are just the coarse leg, but all the other parts of the body, they have cycloid scales. And they also have finlets behind anal and dorsal fins. So tuna have uh, cycloid scales in other parts of the body. And they also have thick or they have prominent scales called the coarse leg in the upper region of the body. Uh, the mackerels, are they scaled? Yes, they are. Their whole body is covered by scale. Those are the anterior part larger, but not developed as a coarse leg. But they have the, the distinguishing feature of the mackerels are the lateral scutes. They have a hard, hard uh, scutes along the lateral line. This one is another the big eye scud. They have cycloid scales. They also have lateral. So in the ciganids or the rabbit fishes or the spine foot, they also have cycloid scales, but they're very fine. These are densely packed over the lower two-third portion of the preopercular region. Preopercular is this portion. The opercular region is the opening of the gills. So there are scales, but there is a very fine, fine scales. So in closing, I would like to say God cares about the details of how we live our lives, including what we eat. In 1 Corinthians 10, 31, it says whether therefore you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Thank you very much. And good evening again, everyone. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Salvador, for this uh, wonderful scientifically evidence-based <laughs> uh, backup on Leviticus 11. Wonderful. Now it's time for opening it to questions. Anybody who has some questions, uh, you can write it here. We would appreciate that you simplify your questions rather than a long comment uh, because it's now time for, for questions and answers. Anybody? Baby brother uh, Gandhi has some questions. Uh, yes, thank you, doctor. It was very interesting the way you present uh, how it's in the Leviticals uh, and the and the scientific way of uh, separating the fins of the fish. I am really interested on in it. But my question regarding our Adventist lifestyle right now, it's it's do you think do you think this still can be applicable in this last days people of God uh, in the Levitical system is can be applied in our present time because after that afterwards we are getting enter into the heavenly canon so i do i do see here uh, before the sin diet system is different then after the sin then flood time is different the period of jesus the diet system is uh, different now after 1844 it's different uh, advices is given by spirit of prophecy 
So I am just wondering about, do you believe that still uh, Leviticus is applicable to our Adventists or we need to go further more than this uh, diet system? Actually, I, I am a, an advocate of vegetarianism. And the only reason what I am uh, studying uh, how uh, what the, the scientific basis for the, the, the eating of aquatic animals is yes. to answer questions and uh, questions on whether they are, why they are considered clean or clean. But uh, if my only advice is that if you are in doubt, then do not eat it. Yes. So you think that uh, you think I should have eaten it and don't eat it. But I'm an advocate of vegetarianism. I eat a lot of fruits and vegetables rather than fish, actually. Thank you, Doctor. Otherwise, I enjoy your presentation. I really uh, Thank got you the very point. Much. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much for that question and answer. Anybody else who likes to raise questions, maybe that. Uh, can really be applicable to our situation right here in Thailand or even in your situation there? Yeah, uh, there, there are uh, areas where in vegetables are not available and so uh, the way for you to be nourished is and the most abundant uh, food that are available would be aquatic animals. Then uh, that, that, that particular uh, circumstance would warrant maybe the justification of eating aquatic animals, which are considered clean according to the Christian I would always believe that the, uh, the Word of God is timeless. It is applicable no matter when, from the beginning until now. So there is supposed to be no question whether it's still applicable in the modern times. It will always be applicable because God so loved us. He laid down all these laws with humankind. The benefit of humankind for us in this mind. It is for our own good and for our own health reasons. And science has time and again provided support that there are parasites in those, there are allergens, there are diseases causing bacteria in, in invertebrates and animals who do not have fins and scales. And so, uh, again, it's for, it's, God has laid out even, everything for us, even in the food. That we have. Okay. Uh, I believe Brother Armin has some question also, uh, though he is posting in the form of statements of quotation. Brother Armin, do you have some question? Um, I think that, thank you so much for sharing about uh, the nice scientific uh, things about the fish. Uh, I actually like fish a lot, uh, not, not eating fish, but I keep fish, uh, saltwater fish here where I stay. I'm actually busy looking at them now, enjoying to your, uh, listening to your presentation. So I just think that you said some valuable things that uh, uh, in in places where um, fruit, vegetables, nuts, and grains is available to us, it's not necessary for us to 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 take fish. But like you mentioned, there are some places, probably like in the North Pole or places like that, where people might struggle to find healthier food, and so they uh, might have to eat clean fish. I saw there was an interesting question in the comment, says, uh, comment section, and maybe you can just answer it for us. Someone asked, what if it's only unclean fish that is available for someone to eat? What should they do? Yeah. Thank you, Armin, for reading it uh, for me. Uh, is, is, there, is there really a place where there are no clean fish? I think God made... Uh, uh, clean fish is more than the unclean. Okay. So, so, so those the, the the uncleanness of aquatic animals, remember, cannot be uh, eliminated by thorough cooking. It's not. 
it's not eliminated by thorough washing. It's really unclean. They are really unclean. And so, uh, just pray to God to bring you to a place where food that is Amen. Amen. is available. Okay, there's another question here from Facebook. Uh, there is, if there is such a time, can anyone ask the speaker, what can we say about seafood flavor that is found in, in, in general flavor, like noodles or labeled like, uh, yeah, like labeled shrimp or any of these chemicals? Uh, what can you say? Uh, We're not supposed to be eat them. Uh, you, you, when you buy something in the market, be sure you're responsible to read the labels. You are not supposed to eat those with laboring coming from shrimps or crabs. They contain a lot of allergens. They contain a lot of allergens. Like for example, my son, uh, he will know that uh, the food is contaminated with like shrimp laboring because immediately there are lots of uh, red roads in him. So there are lots of allergen and contamination. So we are not supposed to uh, buy products with laboring, laboring, uh, seafood labeled uh, processed food. Okay, thank you, ma'am. Uh, it really another... properly release the, the labels. Okay. There's another question maybe from Pastor uh, Nevin, Agustin, John, you'd like to ask about mercury content of, of the fish? Yes, and this is a question from one of them. Hello? Uh, not so clear here. See, could I be heard now? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Hello. Hello. Yes. Yes. Okay. So, so this question is asked from one of the members. Fish have mercury, so pregnant women aren't allowed to eat much fish because of mercury. So, how does that impact our bodies who aren't pregnant? Um, mercury is not only detrimental to pregnant but to all people as well any anybody is affected by uh, mercury it affects our brain actually adversely affecting our uh, brain adversely we call that the minimalism degeneration of our brain um mercury accumulation in the fish only occurs especially uh, for the unclean because of their food habits they they feed on the carrion of the decaying animals in the ocean bottom but uh, remember that uh, clean uh, animals with fins and scales have a very, have a close they have close circulatory system so that if you take out their gills and their uh, the intestine, the, the, anything that they take in, the toxin that they take in is also taken out from the body. So uh, the reports on mercury accumulation in fish, uh, usually they occur in areas wherein there are factories and mining uh, companies that uh, they, they release their mercury waste into the water and these are uh, taken in. Actually, it's not the fish that takes in directly the mercury, but it's the phytoplankton and the, the aquatic plants. And then these aquatic plants are eaten by the fish. So that is why mercury uh, came, uh, went also to the fish. But actually, it's not the, the fish that actually directly ingest the mercury, but uh, they got that from the plants, especially the herbivores, they, uh, they got that from 
the plants that filtered or accumulate mercury in their bodies. So uh, actually, uh, the, the fishes which are found in the open oceans seldom are contaminated by mercury because the, the ocean is very open. They swim far, far away. There, there are no aquatic animals, uh, aquatic plants in there. And usually those that are contaminated or with reports are those that are found. This is are found in the reef, the reef the species of fishes that are fed on aquatic plants which have been used as biofilters for pollutants in the water. Uh, okay, thank you so much. We are running out of time now. It's 2.04. I am afraid we need to finish this one as we stick to our discussion right here. There is one question right here uh, on screen with, uh, by Pastor Chloe. I believe we need to stick to the time right now. Uh, thank you so much for that in here. Uh, perhaps we'll give this questions to this speaker and uh, later on she will find a way to answer this to each one of us who is in need of answer. But right now we will give to the IT uh, to give the certificate of appreciation to our speaker tonight. To show it online. Okay, uh, let me read to you the certificate. Helen Adventist Mission, in collaboration with Southern Asia Pacific Division, present this certificate of appreciation to Dr. Ronald Lee Salvador of Thins and Scales, Scientific Appreciation of Leviticus 11, verse 10, as the resource speaker of the Thailand Adventist Mission Central Zone 2 Virtual Bible and Science Forum held on November 1 to 6, 2020. Uh, here to be signed, the Pastor Niratisai Ipan, President, Thailand Adventist Mission, and uh, also another one, Dr. Bienvenido Mergal, SSD Vice President, NDR or IEL, and Pastor Elton Pelliazar, President, Central Zone to Churches. Uh, thank you so much, ma'am, for this wonderful presentation tonight. We really appreciate it. And now we are to close our program tonight, and we will give the privilege to our speaker to close it through her closing prayer. Okay. Shall we bow our heads for prayer? Almighty Father in heaven, our hearts are filled with gratitude for once again giving us this privilege of worship and for studying your word. We thank you, Lord, for your uh, sustaining power that over the course of years, you are still around to give praises to you. And Lord, uh, thank you for the knowledge that you have imbued in us. Let me Father, that this, that what we have heard this evening, what have studied from your word, will serve as our guide as you walk the life's path today. As we have our nice repose, we have a lady spirit with us, guide us, especially during these times of the pandemic. Keep us safe. The heart of the Bless all our workers, especially the pastors who are here listening, attending this virtual Bible and Science Forum. We bless them, especially, Lord, that we will can use them mightily for the furtherance of the world. We bless the organizers of this forum for the intentions of enlightening ourselves more for your service as we wait for your second coming. Lord, our hearts are full of praise. Yes, we thank you and we acknowledge our sinfulness in your feet. We claim your promises that they be fulfilled in us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, thank you so thank much. You. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. God God bless you. Salvador, God thank bless you very much. Thank you. On behalf of the Southern Asia Pacific Division, Dr. Salvador, thank you. Thank you very much. It's my pleasure. Thank you very much. God bless you, ma'am. God bless you. Bye-bye.